latest political grouping says they have the numbers. Prime Minister gives closing remarks at National Land Summit. And students assess social media against mainstream. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Saturday's news. Interesting times ahead as the numbers game continues in the latest political developments in the country. This morning, members of the opposition moved to join the breakaway government MPs led by Taripori MP James Marape at Laguna Hotel in Port Moresby. Opposition leader Patrick Puraj led a convoy of 24 of its members. They described themselves as not the opposition but the alternative government. Another busy day as members of the media capture what it seems as the biggest movement in PNG politics. Opposition leader Patrick Pruitt leading the opposition pack to join the Marpec camp. It was all smiles, hugs and photo shoots, even familiar faces were around. Informally announcing their ties, they described the camp as the alternate government. And in the opposition we've always kept the work. We've always said that Prime Minister O'Neill has overlooked the interests of our country. This is our opportunity now to correct the mistakes of the past. And I want our country to know that your new government is in place. Former Finance Minister James Morape says it is time people's interests are to be considered and not political gain. He thanked members of the opposition to be on its toes despite the small number strength and now pledged to work together. 24 in opposition, I was finance minister and I struggled to look them in the eyes because we were instructed not to save them well. And, uh, and I am so happy that they still remain constant despite us stopping them. And uh, they're here. Uh, and so people like me and Patrick take the limelight because we're having access to the microphone. It's really this leaders that are yeah, 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 yeah. making this possible. Pastor, gratitude, appreciation to every one of us here, now 57 of us in the house. They are making this change happen for us. To be far from the numbers here. Yeah, uh... Opposition strongman and Vanimo Green MP Belden Nama echoed sentiments of a better government for the people. He says it is time people see a better leadership. Give me assurance to our people from Papua New Guinea also, man. Alternative government will play, sir. Taking into shape. The only former prime minister in the camp, Sam McCarra, described the move as a victory for the 8 million people. He says the country is sick and the alternate government is challenged to correct all the bad decisions done. We can fix it. We have the medicine. But it is Peter O'Neill who is stopping us from giving that medicine. And so we have to move him. Papua New Guinea is sick, but we do not know the seriousness and severity of this sickness. We have a challenge before us to repair Papua New Guinea, to reconstruct Papua New Guinea, to promote development that has heart for people and eyes to see the people. Among other leaders who joined, West New Britain Governor Sassendran Mutuvel announced his resignation from PNC to join the alternate government. And I have every confidence in this young breed of leaders that these leaders will take back PNG and take PNG to the new heights. For now, Laguna Hotel is under tight security with the current camp number at 57. Jack Lopave, Jr., National MTV News. While more ministers tendered their resignations yesterday, the Prime Minister went about normal duties, giving the closing remarks at the National Land Summit. He said customary land ownership must be protected as it is an important part of the people's culture and heritage. Resolutions and recommendations from the summit are meant to find solutions for land issues in the country. So, 
The 2019 National Land Summit started on the 1st of May and ended yesterday at the International Convention Center. The Land Summit is about customary land ownership and how the government can make the laws and processes involved easier and better for the landowners. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill in his closing remarks said it is to ensure that the land is utilized to improve standard of living. So I think that it is an important process. Uh, as of course leaders, we will look into the recommendations of the summit and the, all the uh, uh, reforms that has been suggested and take into account how we can be able to uh, legislate so that we can protect the owners of the land for our people. Population in the country is growing at an alarming rate and land use will continue to be a big problem because of the increased number of people. The Prime Minister urged the people not to allow few individuals to dictate the use of land for their own benefit. We have seen evidence in, 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 the, in, in the past where land are formed to benefit, to, to, to benefit the uh, community and, and, and our, our rural people. But few individuals take uh, advantage of that. The real rightful benefits don't end up with the landowners at all. Lens and Physical Planning Minister Justin Chachenko also said similar sentiments about land use in the city. In order to ensure that our towns of throughout the countries are organised properly and correctly, uh, like any other developing country. At the moment, this is not happening. According to NCD Governor Poes Pakop, about 60% of land in many countries in the world has been modernized. He said because of development, more people will be migrating into the city that will contribute to more land issues. So the management is a fact in the world. There will be more people migrating from the rural to the urban areas. This is a fact that we must come to terms with. And we must appreciate and help to manage for the future. So because it will depend on our people, on our development, on our quality of life, on lifestyle, on how we utilize resources and we balance between rural and land. The Land Summit started with a series of workshops and consultations throughout the country and ended in Port Mosby yesterday. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Among stories after the break, yesterday's celebrations to mark Media Freedom Day and International Midwifery Day. Stay tuned for the details. Welcome back. Yesterday's celebrations for World Press Freedom Day centered on the theme Media for Democracy, Journalism and Elections in Times of Disinformation. With the theme laid out, the focus of the Freedom Day was on fake news and its threat to democracy. People particularly susceptible to a growing... With the advancement in technological revolution, social media has posed a threat on real news. Ordinary citizens can now publish blogs, tweets, podcasts, Facebook posting and Instagram and Flickr images. Also, citizen journalists are now competing with professional journalists for important stories. And other news online platforms are competing with the legacy media. Papua New Guinea is a democratic country. And in order for democracy to be proved, there has to be media freedom, right? Um, therefore, that's why I'd like to stress on the team for this year, which is Media for Democracy, Journalism in Times of Disinformation. And with everything that's coming up um, within Papua New Guinea politics, I think it's in, important on this day that we all recognize the Media Freedom Day. There's lots of social media arising, where, as well as the mainstream media, which the information goes out. But it, it is up to the people who are in control to use the ethics to disseminate the information to the public for yeah, the right information for the public. Journalism is used as a tool or is a fundamental uh, weapon against um, the use, creating that check for the use of power and um, our government, yeah, keeping the government in check. On a 
video posted online by the United Nations on World Press Freedom Day, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, says a free press is essential for peace, justice, sustainable development, and human rights. Mr. Gutierrez says no democracy is complete without access to transparent and reliable information. It is the cornerstone for building fair and impartial institutions, holding leaders accountable, and speaking truth to power. Facts, not falsehoods should guide people as they choose their representatives. Yet, while technology has transformed the ways in which we receive and share information, sometimes it is used to mislead public opinion or to fuel violence and hatred. Civic space has been shrinking worldwide at an alarming rate. And with anti-media rhetoric on the rise, so too are violence and harassment against journalists, including women. MTV's Deputy Regional Head of News, Scott Whitey, also shared his thoughts on media freedom. Mr. Whitey says it is important that the media is free because media freedom in Papua New Guinea didn't just happen. It was decided before independence by PNG's founding fathers under the constitution that the media would be free from any influence at all. Mr. Whitey says the primary role of the media is being the guardian of democracy where its responsibility is to make sure that the government upholds the constitution. Number one role of the media is also the guardian of democracy. Now, work long and make sure that the constitution and government are upholding, bureaucracy are upholding, all systems and processes and you may keep him in check. I may ensure some, I may benefit him all people. Media freedom and revolve around him all people in this country. You must come up with some similar link, name along a line such as the place, na government long. Make sure some similar neck, na cry, na sing out the man Mary, the table, the ground must go the yard, the line, the wagon. I must kind of some of the telephone wire connect straight. Mr. Whitey says this can only happen if the media is truly free, but if it is not, it will be difficult for the telephone line to be connected. We need long educating future generation. Blame me to display something. Um, suppose you mean know educating, now you mean know learning more long benefits from media freedom. Then we may end up on the black country where you mean know critically analyzing or something. Now you mean know critically discussing all issues where I'm affecting you. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. Journalism students at Devon Wood University in Medang celebrated the International Press Freedom Day yesterday, a day dedicated to acknowledge the freedom of press in all democratic nations. In Papua New Guinea, there have been cases where journalists and media houses have seen political influence on how their stories should be presented. Yesterday's celebration was a reminder of the importance of having a free press. Despite the rain, the communication arts students from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences yesterday celebrated the World Press Freedom Day under the theme Media for Democracy, Journalism and Elections in Times of Disinformation. The media, seen as the gatekeeper, can only play its role while given the directive freedom of expression to deliver a message to the people without being intimidated. However, Veteran journalist and keynote speaker John Eggins said with the increase in fake news on social media, it has been a big challenge for journalists in the country. Some countries have that are working on laws to deal with what they consider damaging the effects of fake news online or on social media. And among some of these countries, a Singapore, Malaysia, Germany, France, Russia, and even Australia. Eggins emphasized on the things that are published by the media. He added that declared politicians consider journalists and media workers as friends when they have ideas to sell, but enemies when the idea of the deception is revealed, which he described as ownership. But all these things, what we do when we do things that politicians in particular are not comfortable with, then they say all these things. But in this country, Kachmur, they have not, and they are in a position to do it, they have not legislated to contain freedom of the media. 
joining the university to commemorate the day included Post Korea senior reporter Grace Salmang and director of NBC Medang Makalai Bell, who shared their experiences to the students in reporting such events. Egins reminded the students that it is also the journalist's duty to check and verify the information before publishing. Porivai, National MTV News, Medang. Infant mortality is one of the major causes of death in rural areas in the country due to lack of awareness. A senior midwife from Maprik District Hospital made this statement earlier this week when celebrating International Midwife Day. The actual day is celebrated tomorrow. It is crucial because it is an important reminder on the awareness on midwifery. The International Midwifery Day is celebrated every year to highlight the importance of the role midwives play in the health of the nation. Although the day falls on the 5th of May every year, the health workers at Maprik District Hospital decided to celebrate the International Midwife Day on Wednesday. They were joined by school children as well as police officers and volunteers. The day started as early as 6 a.m. in the morning with a 30-minute walk around town starting from the hospital. The leading midwife from the hospital said a lot of people are not aware of the vital information about pregnancy which leads to many deaths in rural areas. Yes, infant mortality is one of the uh, cause of death in the country and uh, our mothers, uh, so many are unborn. And most of the villages that they live in does not have a road transport. So they come to the uh, antenatal very late. According to the senior midwife, 55 infants died last year due to sexually transmitted disease from mothers who are not diagnosed early. Being the longest serving midwife in the district, she has also witnessed many avoidable and minor issues that lead to death during pregnancy and childbirth due to lack of awareness, especially in rural areas. Everything about training is a need to my staff. And they need to go for further training so that they can come and do the uh, extra things that we cannot do and help the district. A lone serving community health worker in the family planning section also said, despite many challenges, including the closure of the main hospital, she has been the only nursing officer saving the people. clinic because time people close him down, volleyball away, ball service away. So me want to nurse, so I try my best to look look long, make him walk in my school, help give him service long all people. The Maprik Hospital serves as a center point for many rural areas in the district and this is the first time for the district hospital to commemorate the day. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Up to 2,000 families in the Nawai district will benefit from a cocoa nursery and rehabilitation project that was launched in the district last year. The project was initiated by Situm Gobari Cooperative Society with the support of Nawai District Administration. It was funded in 2018 by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at a cost of 76,000 kina. It was officially opened by Prime Minister Peter O'Neill on Wednesday. The nursery has 25,000 cocoa seedlings that will help generate income for cocoa farmers and support economic growth in the district. This was one of the two projects in Nawai district that was funded by Australia's DFAT program at a cost of 76,000 kina. Our partnership with the Nawai District Development Authority aims to enable the district to implement local solutions to local development challenges. Importantly, these projects are led by the district and Australia provides support. The Sigo Coco Cooperative of the Situm Gobari Society was established in 2018. With its establishment, the number of cocoa cooperatives in Morabe has increased to 20. According to the PNG Cocoa Board, Morabe is now ranked as the fourth cocoa producing province in the country and the fifth in the international cocoa market in terms of export. So now the money we like starting this uh Passing where you must run in work law, crap in agriculture inside local country and me. So thank you through the member. One time we'll blame the Australian government to go pass law this law. The Sigo Coco Cooperative said with the support from NAAB administration and the Australian government, they wish to improve their production. 
They have called on the government to assist in providing technical support and transport. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, who was present, said the Department of National Planning has allocated 500,000 kina to help support the project. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. Stories making headlines overseas when we come back, including China's influence on the world stage. Details after the break. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, China's influence around the world is troubling many developed nations. In its latest move, China has set up its first permanent military base overseas and on the doorstep of U.S. forces. But all the new construction in Djibouti is mostly Chinese. It's a site that is becoming all too familiar across the continent as America's adversary pushes its influence further around the world and in this case, right down the road from the U.S. This is where it gets a bit more interesting. Just right there, that is China's first permanent military base overseas. China's military, the People's Liberation Army, is flexing its muscle. Just a 15-minute drive from the U.S. naval base Camp Le Monnier. The two superpowers are now occupying the same crucial piece of Red Sea real estate, placing Beijing right at the doorstep of U.S. military's intelligence gathering and counterterrorism operations. When you first heard about um, the Chinese military presence and their desire to build a base here in Djibouti, what was your initial reaction? So the fact that they uh, put their first military base out here makes good sense. However, some of the incidents and some of their behaviors here in Dorle has, has proven to be challenging, not constructive. Behaviors, the U.S. military says, that include the Chinese pointing military-grade lasers at U.S. aircraft, something the Chinese deny. But U.S. concerns move well beyond isolated incidents. In a few short years, China's military has pushed past its borders, building islands thought to be like unsinkable aircraft carriers in the South China Sea and quietly stationing its troops around the globe. But it's how China invests, says the U.S., using debt to create financial chokeholds that is now the focus of the Trump administration. Seeing the, the investment, the level of investment, the level of influence that, uh, that China has been able to achieve, there has been raising awareness of the predatory lending practices that are in place, the, the debt burdens that can undermine sovereignty. It's just one striking example of the great power competition playing out between the U.S. and China, which according to one U.S. official, America is losing. Here in Djibouti, nearly 80 percent of the country's debt is owned by China. Camp Nemonier does not have direct access to the water, which is why this, Djibouti's main container port, is such a vital lifeline for the Americans. But the U.S. does have some concerns. Given how much of Djibouti's debt China controls, could China try to maneuver that into control over Djibouti's ports? It's happened before on another continent. In late 2017, the Sri Lankan government surrendered a major port to China after failing to pay back its loans. Djiboutin authorities bristle at that notion, aware of the risk of literally banking on China. We don't want to depend on only one uh uh, site or for one continent or for one country. Yeah, the Americans and the Europeans are a bit behind the ball. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. That was Express 2019. At an annual U.S. naval exercise where the Chinese were America's invited guests for the opening ceremony, the Chinese military declined to be interviewed. But China has long maintained its investments come with no strings attached. And the investments continue to come. China has tripled its loans to Africa since 2012. To counter China's financial dominance, America is trying to push itself as the military partner of choice. But if the current trends are anything to go by, it may not be enough. Now, how about this for a first to date? Climbing Mount Everest. That's how one adrenaline junkie couple from the U.S. first met. But it's that shared love of scaling great heights that's now keeping them apart as they each attempt to set records on different continents. Adrian Ballinger and Emily Harrington from Squaw Valley, California, are setting out in two very different places tonight. 
Adrian has led more than 100 expeditions on five continents. Mountain Climber, sponsored by Eddie Bauer. So good to be climbing high again. Emily is one of the world's top rock climbers, sponsored by the North Face. We go on our own adventures. We'll be back together soon. Adrian is about to summit Everest for the ninth time. And Emily is attempting to become the first woman to free climb Yosemite National Park's 3,000-foot El Capitan in just one day, using the Golden Gate route, a sheer, heavily exposed cliff. I'm pretty scared right now. I'm pretty nervous and like anxious, and I really want to get to the top of them. Attached to ropes she won't be using as aid, but will catch her if she falls. Now, on the eve of her challenge, we brought the two of them together on live television today. It's so wild to be talking to you, Em, and, you know, right now what you're doing is so much more dangerous and scary than I am. Emily's signal a little bit fuzzy. We were hoping she could hear us, and more importantly, could hear Adrian. I want you to climb fast and come home! <laughs> Adrian, I hate to compare, but it looks like Emily's in a slightly more uh, precarious situation than you are. <laughs> She's hanging on a rope, but I'm in this beautiful base camp. I've got a heater I can go back to in a minute. Both an inspiration to us all, and both about to set out on their missions. Emily, we are rooting for you, and Adrian, you as well. Be safe. Both yes, be safe. safe. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro has called on armed forces to defeat any coup plotter following two days of clashes between opposition and pro-government forces. At the heart of crisis is the country's economy that's in free fall and affecting the older population. Dominoes in the courtyard of the Mother Teresa senior home in Caracas. There's not much else to do here. If life for Venezuelans is tough and undeniably it is, it's even worse for the elderly. This is not a good country in which to grow old. If we didn't have this place, how many of these people would be on the streets or dead? Thank God here they are alive. It's not five star, but at least they survive. Baldilio Vega and his volunteer staff do their best to feed and house nearly 80 people here. The oldest, 84-year-old Carmen Cecilia. It's a heartbreaking fact that here in Venezuela, many of the elderly are simply given up by their families. Not unwanted, far from it, but victims of a brutal choice by the family. Do you feed the children or do you feed the grandparents? There are many people here who are sad. Their hearts are sad because they have given everything in their life and their families, for one reason or another, send them here. Everything here is donated and donations are drying up. Pensions, if you get one, almost worthless in this crumbling economy, perhaps $7 a month. There's no basking in retirement golden years in Venezuela. Life here is Spartan, austere, but it is life. Alternatives unthinkable or unaffordable. The stories here are so similar, the pain and disappointment so individual. We meet Victoria Madriz, 74 years old. She has family in Caracas, but there was simply no room or money to support her. There were a lot of people in the house, my brother's children and their children. It was too much. A familiar refrain, families who couldn't cope or who simply left. An estimated three million Venezuelans have fled their country and its wretched economy in recent years. Many didn't take their parents or grandparents they couldn't afford to. Baldilia Vega says he won't let these people down even if he says his government has what he wants is change, help. I urge Venezuela, let the humanitarian aid in. We need the food, the medicine. Instead of buying weapons, we need medicines and food. The residents of the Mother Teresa home say in the meantime they'll survive. They have to. All of us, we have hope. Yes, yes. Chuka Sports is next. We'll have kickboxing and rugby league. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. Jonathan Tuhu is looking to win his title bout tonight against his Thai opponent when he takes center stage at the main event of the kickboxing PNG's Best of the Best versus the Rest of the World 3 in Port Moresby. 
The fight is taking place about now at the Sir John Guy's Indoor Stadium. Jonathan's fight will be part of six title bouts when PNG opponents take on Thailand, Australia, Pakistan, Malaysia and New Zealand kickboxers. The stage is set for Jonathan Tuhu of Papua New Guinea to take on his Thai opponent, Chi Jian Kai of Thailand, at the Sir John Guy's Indoor Complex for the WKF Middleweight World Muay Thai title. Tuhu is part of the world title kickboxing showdown in the third edition of the PNG's Best of the Best versus the rest of the world. Tuhu is not taking things lightly and is hitting the bags hard at training. The young man who grew up in Mendi from Chimbu and Medang is no pushover. He has 33 professional fights with two title belts under his waist. I have two titles under WKF Intercontinental and the other one under WBC uh, Mutai Supreme title. Out of the 33 bouts, he has 15 losses but 13 wins with 12 of the wins knockouts. He fights in kickboxing and Muay Thai. For kickboxing, is you kick pants and the knees. It's like more explosive. And then for Muay Thai, you come with your rim, uh, like uh, timing. And it's always, you catch kick and sweep, more cleansing, grapplings, elbows, and it's more like thrift style. Yeah. Most of his fights can only be accessed on YouTube and he has been longing for a chance to fight in front of his family and his nation. Only what was the video of my opposite fight, so this one, I'm really excited for them to come and watch, yeah. He is known for knocking out opponents much taller than him, and he already has his strategy to defeat his opponent, Chi Jian Kai. I'm longer manly league than me, so I'll walk inside and then more leg kick and break his leg and go win. Fidelis Sukina National, MTV Sports. The SBP and G Hunters are being urged to remain focused and not indulge in any more acts of protocol breaching. The coach does not put the team on lockdown, but players seem to be misusing their free time doing activities against the team's principles. The SPP and G Hunters' discipline issues and attitude towards their game has been an ongoing concern. But coach Michael Morrow is urging his team to focus on tomorrow's 3 p.m. home game against the Townsville Blackhawks. The SPP and G Hunters will be playing the Townsville-based team for the Kokoda and New Guinea Cup at the Oil Search National Football Stadium. We just have to believe in our, ourselves. Uh, we, we've, uh, moving forward, we, we, we spoke about a lot of things, uh, the discipline issues. Uh, yeah, that was a big concern for us, you know, with those two players uh, sent home. That, that's probably, uh, you know, uh, good time for, for these boys to, uh, you know, think about what they, they're doing after hours, that sort of thing. So The coach added that the players are not on any strict lockdown, but it was important for them to attend team meetings and training that were compulsory for the team to prepare for their matches. We don't lock these players up uh, 24 hours. They still allow time to go and see family, you know, do their own thing. But, you know, they, they need to be committed to the team when there's team engagements, uh, you, know, you know, training or recovery, that sort of thing, videos, meetings. You know, they're required to attend that, you know, just, just our standards. So we can't continue to, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow that to happen to uh, any, any play in future yet. Yeah. He added that players will be told to have time off to spend with their families or do other things and will not be allowed to play in the Intercity Cup competition during the team's bye weekend next week. We go away for our first bye next weekend, so we plan to just keep all the players, uh, send them home, spend some time with family for four or five days, and then once they come back on a Saturday, we just have to keep them train and prepare for that winner manly game uh, the week after. So. Uh, that's uh, that's what we, we the message will be sent out to all the uh, diesel car franchise owners. Make sure they just uh, you know won't ask for their place and we just keep them and make sure they they get uh, proper treatment training before they go back and join them. Freely Sukina National MTV Sports. The SBPNG Hunters team members received their All Search National Football Stadium memberships on Tuesday. The membership cards will allow the SBPNG Hunters to enjoy the stadium facilities and take part in the stadium activities on non-game days. 
The Oil Sets National Football Stadium Venue Management on Tuesday gave the SPP and G Hunter Stadium membership cards. Oil Sets National Football Stadium General Manager Lee Pokarop was thankful the Hunters' presence in stadium-organized events created a more lively atmosphere. We've always had the support of Coach and his team, and we've always had between two to three Hunters joining us. We're very grateful for that. In everything that you start, you need to grow it and develop it, and your presence on the Friday nights has helped our members see a value um, in coming, you know, becoming members of the Old Search National Football Stadium and to attend the Friday nights. Apart from having access to stadium activities on non-hunters game days, the team members and staff will benefit from discounts offered by the stadium and their partners. You also get up to 1,500 kina worth of discounts. You get a voucher book with your membership from Lamana, from Jmart, uh, from the Gateway Hotel, uh, from uh, the Sizzler's restaurant in the Gateway Hotel and we've got other partners that we're bringing on board as well so you can save money and realize value uh, every time you purchase products from uh, our partners. Port Mosby Rugby Football League and Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League will be receiving their stadium memberships as well. The PNG RFL also receive their memberships and we have also some memberships to pass on to the Port Mosby Rugby League who are our friends and associates here at the stadium. PNG RFL CEO Reata Rao thanked the venue management for their support in giving the membership to the team. And this time I want to say thank you on behalf of our chairman and our board and our staff for this uh, membership uh, uh, accorded to the PNG Rugby League and, uh, and also to the Hunters. So thank you very much. Fidelis Sukina National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports continues after the break with more. Don't go away. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The sport of rugby league is reaching new heights in creating a development pathway. The Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League launched a new era in the mini mod competition for children as young as six years old to play the modified version of rugby league. Papua New Guinea has rugby league as its most popular sport, but what it lacks is the junior development aspect of the code. Papua New Guinea now has the opportunity to have children at the ages of 6 to 12 learn the basics of rugby league. And in future, when they decide to have a professional career, they can be playing in a stadium like this, the Old Search National Football Stadium, in the PNG LNG Kumuls or the SPPNG Hunters. Under 6 to 12 Rugby League is referred to as Mini Mod, the modified version of Rugby League. The Mini Mod of Papua New Guinea was launched yesterday at the Oil Search National Football Stadium with the Chief Executive Officer of PNG RFL, Rea Tau Rao, doing the official kickoff. Okay. Hey. There was excitement all around with children as young as these six-year-olds having a carefree game as they chased each other around the field. NRL in PNG has been rolling out the Minimod program in Port Mosby and General Manager Kathy Neap is optimistic the program will help the children learn respect towards referees and their teammates. Teaching the kids as early as um, 6 to 12 years old, um, it, builds, it gives them the experience to feel the game of rugby league and also to instinct the skills in them and teach them the positive behaviors and how they should react towards the referees, uh, towards their teammates. From the outset, it looks quite different from a professional rugby league match. Well, these children have the rules modified for their level of understanding. So they grasp the fundamentals of teamwork and passing. It's not always about winning. Growing up as a kid, um, they it's quite hard to uh, for the kids to understand but mini mode the rules are modified breaking down into um, easier concept where the kids will understand so it's easier for the kids to relate to and play to former nrl referee shane hayne had a refereeing stint with the under 12s with his 15 years of refereeing in the nrl he knows this is the right step to develop the game um, so they get educated at an early age on, on the rules of the game uh, and then as they go up each level um, 
they get added, little things get added on into their game, whether you're a player or an official. So by the time they get to the top, where previously they had to start from scratch at the top, um, this way all kids coming through now will be nurtured and, and educated. But it won't be tackling for these children, but tag and a slow progression to contact as schools look forward to the May 26th start of their season. Fidelis Sukina National, MTV Sports. To athletics abroad, South Africa's two-time Olympic champion Kasta Semenya has been competing in the 800 meters recently. It is the last time before controversial new rules kick in restricting testosterone levels in female athletes with differences in sexual developments. The 28-year-old showing a clean pair of heels to all of her rivals, winning in dominant fashion in a time of a minute 54.98 seconds. That's a meet record, by the way, and a world-leading time as well, beating her nearest challenger by nearly three seconds in Qatar's capital city. Here are the key takeaways, though. Afterwards, Semenya quashing speculation over her future in the sport by saying only God can end her career, while also appearing to categorically rule out ever taking medication to run in her favor event, namely the 800 metres. And that ends Chukai Sports, the weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. Showers right across the southern region in Port Mosby, Daru, Kerama, Alotau and Popandita. In the Momase region, showers in Lei and rain showers in Wau, Medang, Wewek and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, rain showers in Lorengau and showers in Kavien, Kokoporobao, Kimbe and Puka. And in the Highlands region, rain then morning fog in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kondiawa, Mendi and Wabek. There is a strong wind warning, strong southeast winds of 25 to 34 knots expected to continue for the next 24 hours, causing rough seas and high sea walls, swells rather. Uh, small crafts and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before and after going out to sea. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the way it is this Saturday, the 4th of May 2019. From the entire news team, pleasant viewing, good night.